Hello everybody, my name is Michael Freeston. I'm Director of Quality Improvement at the Early Years Alliance and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session on staff morale and motivation and for this webinar we are joined by our good friend and colleague Anna Galowski from Stratus, Stratus Coaching. Hi Anna. Hello, hi Michael, lovely to see you. Um, I've done several sessions in the past with Anna on well-being, and I have to say, I still do one of the exercises. I still do the three things that are good about the day while I'm brushing my teeth before I go to bed, Anna. They're always really e extremely interesting, but also give practical considerations for how people can take their, their particular issues forward. Um, Anna's in control of the slides today, so if, you are, if I could ask you to just move on. I will just spend a couple of session, uh, seconds just doing an overview for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, just giving an overview of the Strong Early Years London project. Um, it's a 10 month program funded by the, the Mayor of London, um, being coordinated and worked in partnership with all 32 boroughs uh, across the capital to try and support the business skills capacity and development of PBI providers, nurseries, preschools, and childminders um, as we try and recover from the pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, there's a website which will give more information about um, the program and its activities. Um, looking, it's hosted by the London Business Hub and the link when you get the slides tomorrow, please don't spend a great deal of time trying to write all this information down. We will circulate the slides to everybody who is registered for this session tomorrow. And that, that blue line um, is a live link and will take you directly to our page on the website. We're also um, delivering a series of webinars and Business Connect online training sessions. And also importantly, we are now at the phase of being able to offer one-to-one -one support um, to settings. So on a range of topics, uh, which are listed there in terms of um, budgeting controls, marketing, all those elements which will help um, secure the sector going forward in London as we come out of the pandemic. Um, and if you wish to register your interest to have find out more information about the one-to-one -one support we can offer, do please send um, Jonathan, who's on today's session, an email to register your interest. Um, his details will come up at a slide at the end, as will mine. Um, and so if there's any further information you'd like about the project as a whole, just please feel free to get in touch with us via email. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Michael. I'll say no more. Over to Anna. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, so very warm welcome to everyone. It's lovely to see some familiar uh, names and faces and obviously a very warm welcome um, to people who may not have attended one of the sessions that I've done with the Early Years Alliance previously. Um, as Michael said, my name's uh, Anna, Anna Galowski. Um, I live down in Brighton um, and I do lots of work around, um, particularly around sort of like well-being um, in organisations and that kind of covers morale and motivation. So there's, there is definitely um, a link there. And that's particularly the topic that we're going to be having a look at today because what we're noticing for a lot of organisations and not just early year settings is that we're going through lots of change at the moment, and this is having impacts on people, you know, whether it's getting used to hybrid working, going back into the offices again, um, getting used to new routines. Um, everyone seems to be impacted in some way. Um, obviously, being humans, you know, we all respond to things differently. So some of this um, in the slides that I'm going to go through with you may be more relevant to your particular settings or individual circumstances. Um, so there's two parts really to the session today. The first one is going to be looking at morale and engagement, because I think that's a really important topic to consider um, as we're sort of you know, transitioning back to, dare I say normal yet, I still feel it's still even now slightly too early to say back to normal. Um, and then I really want to have a look at motivation with you, because motivation is something that we're hearing a lot from organisations, you know, how can I keep my staff motivated, you know, going through lots of challenges, lots of changes, uh, you know, still things, things are still very uncertain, and what, what is motivation? So I'm going to go through some of this stuff with you. Um, it is interactive, so there's a couple of points where I might ask you um, a couple of questions, so please feel free to answer those um, in the Q&A um, or the chat box, I can try and keep an eye on both of them. Um, alternatively, if this is your lunch break and you just want to sit back and listen, that is also absolutely fine as well. Don't feel that you have to um, participate. And as Michael said, the slides will be available for you um, after uh, today's session. 
Um, so morale, what is morale then? Uh, you know, it's something that we hear you know, quite a lot in organisations, all sorts of organisations. Um, it's defined as the overall satisfaction. You know, it's the kind of like it's the culture of the organisation. Um, it's the outlook, you know, are people looking forward to things so they feel positive? Um, it's the feelings of well-being um, that an employee holds in the workplace. So that's why, you know, it's very much link linked to um, mental health and well-being. Um, and in other words, it's about how satisfied they feel when they come into their work environment. Do they feel comfortable? Do they feel confident? Uh, do they feel able to do their best? But also importantly, you know, do they enjoy their work? You know, we spend so many working hours in the workplace. We want people to come and enjoy their work. You know, it doesn't mean it's always going to be easy, but we want people to enjoy things. We want people to be loyal to us. You know, we want to build up those long term relationships with with our people. And, you know, linking to my um, pet favourite topic, which is um, sort of you know, stress, you know, if people do feel engaged, they've got high morale, they feel more comfortable and confident, it's going to be beneficial to their stress levels um, and lower it. What are some of the things that affect morale, though, that we need to sort of be very mindful of as leaders or, or managers in, in settings? Um, one of the, the top ones is a lack of directional clarity. People need to have some kind of like certainty. We want to know what's expected of us. You know, we want to know what we're supposed to be achieving that day, that week, um, that period of time as well. So setting clear expectations is really important. Burnout is going to affect morale. You know, if people are exhausted, if they're sort of you know, run ragged, you know, that's going to affect their morale and their engagement um, and their happiness levels. Um, poor leadership, um, that shouldn't say micro-man, that should actually say micro-management, I do apologise, um, but you know, micro-mans might affect morale, I don't, I don't know, um, but it's if people don't feel that they're, you know, treated as adults, you know, they're not empowered, they're not trusted, you know, if someone's always checking over them, or they haven't got a very good leader, that can affect morale, you know, so it's about being aware of the shadow that we cast, not listening, um, big one that can affect morale. If people don't feel listened to, if they're not being heard, it can really impact on them. Um, and as I always say to, to people, we have two ears and one mouth and we should use it um, in that proportion. Other things that affect morale bizarrely is when they feel that their leaders or managers are avoiding tough decisions. Um, you know, people, you know, need to know that, you know, people have got their back, their leaders and managers have got their back. And I was doing some work for a train company a few years ago and morale was seriously affected by the onboard crew because there's one person who really wasn't a team player and nobody was very pleased with that person. It was affecting morale. But what really added to the situation was that the, the manager in charge wasn't doing anything about it. They weren't stepping up and having the conversations. And that was affecting the morale more than the actual um, person itself. But there's lots of things that we can do to boost morale. Um, you know, things that, you know, obviously I'm sure you're aware of, but just as a um, refresher or a reminder, um, have lots of one-to-ones um, with your people. Um, have these on a frequent basis so that we can check in to keep an eye on how people are feeling. You know, it's the whole adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But, you know, unless we have these conversations, we're not going to know how people are feeling and what's affecting our teams. Give people and employees the tools to ask for feedback and provide you with feedback as well. Um, and I think this is sometimes quite hard for leaders and managers to do, to to be vulnerable and to accept feedback from people. But one of the key things is, you know, if we are um, asking for feedback and expecting feedback from our teams, making sure that we're acting on it as well. You know, there's nothing worse than, you know, being asked for our inputs and ideas and suggestions, and then none of them are ever acted on. You just, well, what's the point? You know, why, why bothering asking for me? Um, training managers, leaders um, to become better coaches. And by this, I mean, sort of, you know, that they can empower their teams, that they can learn how to ask open questions, give directions, set objectives, um, really about equipping them with the skills and the competence to do their job uh, well with their teams. Help people to develop, you know, personally and professionally. You know, we like to grow, we like to develop. People don't like to sort of, you know, be static or stagnate in their roles. 
and really show employees how much you appreciate them. I cannot emphasize how important this is. And um, Harvard Business Studies, um, they had a look at resilience and they were asking people what affected people's resilience, which is also uh, linked to morale. And one of the top answers was not having appreciation or recognition in organizations. So they were expecting the bigger stuff in life to affect people's resilience, but actually it's the day-to-day thanking people, showing that recognition and appreciation to people. Doesn't cost anything, but if people feel valued and recognized, they will be much more engaged and loyal. And don't forget to have fun. Um, You know, we spend so much of our working lives um, in the workplace with our colleagues. try and have fun, you know, inject, you know, some, you know, lighthearted moments, humour, social events um, from time to time. So let's move on to having a look at motivation. So we've kind of like looked at morale from a sort of, you know, a setting point of view, but what about individual motivation, which is linked to morale? And the first thing I want to sort of, you know, focus on is, is willpower, because quite often I hear the term willpower and motivation used hand in hand but they're very different things and the way that this can be described is that we have these best intentions you know whether it's diet whether it's fitness regime but it's trying to understand why you know despite having these best laid plans do they not always go according to how we think they're going to do Um, and that's because it's not always easy to stick to our decisions motivation is not the same as intention you know intention is what we decide to do motivation is actually what drives us to do it it's that emotional part of it so we can have all the good intentions that we like you know that beach body that diet that kind of you know whatever it is um but it's motivation that we need to actually inspire us to take action so sounds great i guess in theory so why don't we always do what we intend to do you know why is it that as humans we don't always stick to these plans um that's because quite often we're relying on our willpower And willpower is very different to motivation. Willpower is when we're having to remind ourselves on a regular basis to do something. The limits of willpower, I was just saying, I was fascinated by that distinction between motivation and willpower. Almost the implication that willpower is trying to make yourself do things that you're not particularly keen to do. Is that a that that's the fair point yeah willpower is when we're sort of you know constantly having to do something because you know we need to we have to we must do we tend to have to remind ourselves on a regular basis you know must do this must do that um it's really hard to to muster up that willpower when you're tired um you know when you've got lower glucose levels um and also when we've gone through lots of decisions where we where we've been testing a willpower so that's why so we know our favorites of starbucks and costa coffee very clever because you know we go past all the big cakes and it's like no not going to touch the big cake going to avoid those going to avoid those going to avoid those going to avoid those then you get to the till you're just about to get away with it and that's where they've got the little the flapjacks and the little biscuits it's like oh i'll just have a little one so that's where you know the willpower lets us down um it just takes up a lot of time and effort. So what we really want to get to is motivation. And this is the, um, from the Latin to move. Um, You know, it's being eager to act, you know, we want to do this stuff. And the value of motivation, you know, particularly in a business context or in a settings, is that it is really linked to staff uh, staff engagement and morale. Um, It's also linked to that discretionary effort. So this is going the extra mile that people are more likely to do if they feel motivated because they want to do a good job, whether it's for the, you know, for the children, whether it's for the the colleagues as well. On the flip side, demotivated staff are more likely to work to rule. They'll do the minimum, they'll come in, do the bare minimum that's required, and then they're going to go home. And they're also more likely to leave the organisation sooner rather than later. So what I want to do is just to ask you to think about what motivates you, because it's very it's very individual. It's very personal. um, And if people would like to share some of their thoughts, either in the the Q&A or the chat box, um, that'd be wonderful. But what what motivates you? You know, what helps you get up and out of bed and go to work or or whatever it is that um, that you do? Money, money. (laughs) Thank you for your honesty and candor, Midia. Children, Sharon, and being valued. Being valued, yeah. Yeah, knowing you're helping others. Yeah. Yeah, these are really lovely things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Interesting one about money, actually. Um, 
and there's also another one helping other people and hold these hold these in your mind because we're going to come back to these um in a moment um money is a really interesting one because i think um you know often we think that money is going to be like the number one motivator for people but as we can see there yes it is important we all need enough money to, to live on and to survive because people are, they're worried about money you know that's going to affect their performance but we can see so much of the other things that have come into the chat box are um security you know the staff the teams that we work with you know the purpose and stuff like that um knowing that we're there for our staff encouraging them to learn as well you know these are you know fantastic altruistic things um just let me look in the um um, in the Q&A. Oh, so your passion for early years as well. Yes, and trying to multitask, look in the Q&A and the chat box um, as well. Um, apparently someone has raised a hand. I can't uh, see Selena, the question. Yeah. Um, I need to try and unmute in that situation. Oh. Uh, uh, I lowered my hand as a result there. If you keep talking, Anna, I shall try and engage it so that we can get uh, okay. Shalini through. OK, lovely. Thank you. Um, but as you know, as we can see, there's so much more to motivation than just money. Money is a motivator for, you know, for a certain extent, but above and beyond that, it's quite limited. So what we need to do is just think about a task that has really motivated you. This can be something in your current job. It can be maybe something which you do outside of work. If you're part of a community or a charity or do volunteer work or something, um, but can you just try and think of something, a task that has really motivated you recently, something that you had lots of energy for, you know, you really wanted um, to do it. Um, you don't have to share in the chat box. because Obviously, this is personal. If you do want to, that is totally up to you. But I'll just give you a moment just to think about a task that has really motivated you. Oh, I love that one. Leanne, I'm going to use it as, as the example throughout this, making your best friend's wedding cake and seeing her face when it was done. Um, right, that is absolutely spot on. That is perfect. So we're going to use that as the example as we go through the session. Um, but obviously, refer back to your own tasks that has motivated you um, individually um, as well. So when it comes to motivation, there's three um, aspects to motivation. We've got the incentive, you know, so what's the reason why we're doing this, you know, that external in incentive. Um, we've got that inner drive. So, you know, it's that internal kind of, you know, I want to do this, you know, which is above and beyond that willpower. We have to do it and force ourselves to do something. But also we have to feel that we can actually do something as well. You know, if someone's never made a cake before and then they're asked to make a cake for their for their best friend's wedding, you know, they are going to really struggle with motivation. However much they want to help their friend out, however much they want to make that cake, if they really have never made a cake before, then they're probably going to struggle. So let's have a look at some of these aspects of the um, of the motivation model. So external incentives um, these are divided into sort of two types of incentives really we've got the carrot and the stick um, the carrot and stick was probably sort of show my age now a very kind of like 80s management style of work you know we incentivized someone they did something or we threatened them um, but you know it still kind of happens today to a certain extent you know that incentive can be you know because we want to have um more money, we want a promotion, we'd like a pay rise, or there's kind of like a bonus or something. It might be power again, sort of you know, promotion, prizes, admiration, or just praise and feedback as well. The stick, you know, the other side of the incentive can be the ones that we want to avoid. So, you know, we want to avoid missing a deadline or, you know, we don't want to be sort of you know, threatened with something, um, you know, the evaluation, the Ofsted and stuff like that. Um, so this is the incentive, the external um, incentive that we have. You know, so it's either something that we want to achieve or it's something that we're trying to avoid. So just going back to, you know, the task that motivated you, what was your external reasons for it? Um, you know, so thinking of um, thinking of that. So if we think, if, you know, so if we take sort of, you know, Leanne's example, sort of, you know, your best friend's wedding cake, you know, that incentive by the sound of it was that admiration, you know, just doing something your friend, you know, seeing her face, um, you know, when it was done, you know, that is probably the external incentive um, itself. Plus, you probably had the deadline, you know, the wedding date would have been an external incentive as well. You know, you had to um, 
had to get it done. Um, I love the thing about the money. I'll come on to that um, bit in a moment, Leanne, as well. Um, that's really great. So think about your own task that motivated you. you know, what was your external reason for having to do it? Then the next part um, that I want to mention is about incentives, so coming back to money, because they did some um, research on some participants and there was two groups of participants and they were given um, puzzles to solve. One of the groups of participants was given um, a dollar reward for each puzzle that they solved, um, and but the other group was, wasn't given anything at all. Um, what they did is they'd have to solve puzzles for 10 minutes, then they'd have an eight minute break, and then they'd have to go into the next set of puzzles. What they found is that the group that was given a financial reward would work for the 10 minutes solving the puzzle, then they would take the full eight minute break. The other group who wasn't given any financial reward at all carried on trying to solve the puzzles throughout the break as well. So they were much more happy and engaged and motivated to keep growing, to keep going purely because of that incentive of that sort of praise and that recognition of solving the puzzle. So sometimes when we can take money out of it, um, um, we can you know, see other incentives as well that drive us. Anna, can I just ask? Did, yeah. Did, did the unpaid group know that the other group were being paid for it? I don't think they did in terms of the um, in terms of the experiment. No, they right. didn't. Right. Um, however, when it looked at enjoyment of the task as well, those who weren't being paid in, actually stated that they enjoyed doing the task more than those who were actually being sort right. of paid for it. And, and the money was kept at a nominal value, so that wouldn't be yeah. a huge influence, but it was just significant enough um, to make a difference. Great. Um, we also, as part of motivation, we have to have the inner drive. There has to be a reason why we want to do this as well. And that can be um, individual. You know, we just believe it's something important. It's it's to do with our values. It's to do with our beliefs. It can be purely because we just enjoy something just for the hell of it. And that is also absolutely fine. That could be a motivation factor in itself. It can be for self-esteem. It can be for that sense of autonomy, just interest in something you know sometimes people you know read or do particular courses not because they want the academic qualification but you know they're just interested in that topic or a sense of accomplishment you know I did it I got there it doesn't matter whether anyone else knows about it but I did it I achieved it doing something for a friend you know to, to give her a cake um, because you care about her you know that in itself can be an inner drive for people you know and I noticed in in the chat box I can't sort of go back in it at the moment but you know a lot of the motivating things was about our teams it's about our, you know the children it's about our colleagues that we work with it's about you know all of that kind of stuff you know which is you know absolutely gorgeous to see sometimes you just want that sense of relatedness you know we like to be in teams we like to be in sort of you know groups and stuff um and the esteem of others as well, so supporting um, our staff um, as well to help them with their development as well. So that's another one of the key components um, of the motivation model. So again, thinking back to the original task that motivated you, can you think about what was your inner drive that motivated you for doing it? And it could either be just, you know, something that you enjoy doing you know maybe you made a cake for yourself because you liked making cakes and you fancied a slice of cake that is absolutely fine or it can be you know um you know something that was interesting to you or it was you know for or on behalf of someone else but just have a think about you know what was that task you know what was the what was the inner driver there for you and just take a moment to to think about that And then the third component of the motivation model is that ability to succeed, you know, because it doesn't matter however much we want to do something. If you don't feel that you've got the confidence or um, the ability or able to learn the skill in order to do it, that's going to hold us back and that's going to stop us feeling um, as motivated. Um, and what happens is, you know, that 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 ability to succeed Means, means that we're really engaged in the task. You know, we need to feel that we can do something well. Again, this is very much linked um, to stress and pressure because if we don't feel that we're gonna do a very good job and we're gonna be evaluated 
or get negative feedback, it's going to stop us going forward and wanting to try things. Um, I love the Yans then. So sticking with the cake example, as you can tell, I quite like cake. Um, it was a sense of achievement to know I could accomplish it. You had never made a cake in your life. I am, I am so impressed, Leanne. I think that is just absolutely amazing. Um, can I just pick up on that then, um, Anna? And just from Leanne's point, you talked about the ability to succeed. Leanne, I'm assuming, didn't know if she had the ability to succeed when she set out on the task. And that's interesting, isn't it? But it is. It's really interesting. Um, and this is where it really ties in nicely to to mental health and well-being and our resilience. And it's it's wanting um, to, to achieve something, but also letting go of thinking that things have to be absolutely perfect, because what we find is that what can stop people from wanting to, you know, to try things or to attempt new things is if they get fixated on the fact it has to be perfect. Then they don't want to attempt it you know they would much rather not even bother in the first place so if people could think okay you know i'm going to make a wedding cake it might not be you know the most perfect one that you might buy from harrods but you know there's so much more love and care going into it and if there's a little smudge on the icing it doesn't matter you know it's not going to detract from the whole day itself so you know wanting to do something and thinking you know I can learn you know and as um, Leanne says there you know watching a lot of YouTube videos you know and this is where we notice that people are engaged you know because they want to learn they want to develop um you know this is you know um applicable to to any any sports um as well you know athletes sports people they have to want to achieve but they have to practice they have to learn they have to develop musicians as well and I think um I can't remember the psychologist's name but he says in order for us you know to become um experts in something we have to put in 10,000 hours of practice to really sort of you know, develop our skills and obviously we don't need to do that for everything but it is about you know having that you know that wanting to to learn it and sort of you know attempting to it as well just, just pick up on one of the comments Sharon has put into the chat and the, the motivation was a fresh idea coming from a new member of the team I think that there's an inspirational element to that as well isn't there yeah yeah and this is where it links beautifully with um the morale but, you know we need to have that feedback we want to encourage you know insights and ideas and we need you know sometimes a bit of a different idea from people as well to spark it because otherwise we're just going to do the same old same old and get very stale and boring and monotonous so really welcoming um you know new ideas is really important because then people feel valued they feel recognized they feel listened to and heard so it links to morale and to their motivation as well um do we have any other questions just um just uh, to there's make just one that's alta who's actually she said unfortunately she's been called away but it is to reassure her that we she will get copy of the recording and also the slides that go with it as well so it's yes um, absolutely. sorry you have to leave this alter but that's perfectly fine yes absolutely um so yeah so ability um is is about our skills um it's about our capacity and resources Resources to achieve things and with all of this stuff um, you know it's much easier to tap into that skills and the resources or even ask people for support to help us um, with the situation if our mental resources are well um, relaxed and rested and healthy you know so if we're feeling absolutely burnt out and frazzled it's going to be much harder to get that ability and that drive um, you know so this is where sort of you know this does link a little bit sort of you know, slightly more tenuously to my to my topic of mental health and well-being but I also think I just uh, I'm sure we might get some comments along these lines um, that that final comment there is particularly pertinent we we're finding from our members and from the sector generally the point you said about fatigue and exhaustion over the last 18 months that we've had, um, staying open when many schools were shut, for example, in the second lockdown and the support provided to families, it has been a particularly challenging and exhausting time yeah. for the early years sector. And yeah. they felt exposed. There was all the issues yeah. about lack of PPE for the sector. And, mm -hmm. and all of those things you said about being felt worthy and respected was not there, not from the settings themselves, but some from, from government policy, for example, yeah. that, mm -hmm. that there was, uh, we are not being treated with that respect that we feel mm -hmm. was necessary. So, so I think that is a particularly pertinent point about the mental capacity of people uh, to yeah. continue. Yeah, and absolutely understandable. Um, um, in addition to this session, I am doing um, various um, evening sessions with a Early Years Alliance. So. I'm happy to share those details with yourself and Jonathan if other people 
haven't received details of those which is looking at how can we look after ourselves you know because it is so important you know we can't have motivation if if we're not you know from starting from a good place um in the first place you know sort of you know the top athletes you know they have to be physically fit and healthy to be motivated to achieve the best that they can do you know if they're ill um you know suffering from sort of no aches pains and stuff like that um you know they're not going to be able to to succeed however much they might want to so it's so important because we use our brains totally um and this is why things you know sort of you know rest restoring recharging our own mental batteries switching off as much as we can is so fundamental so thinking back to your task that motivated you, um, what were the skills and abilities, you know, that you used to achieve it? So with Leanne's case, you know, she did lots of research, lots of YouTube videos, you know, so self-taught. Um, I suspect there's quite a bit of practice before you did the final cake as well. Um, you know, maybe sort of, you know, talking to your friend, you know, did she have something in mind that she, that she wanted, you know, something that you could work towards? Um, as well but um, again if you wish to share that'd be fantastic um, but again if it's just a personal one um, you know that's that's also absolutely fine for you to reflect on um, so think about you know your skills your abilities you know what were some of the resources that you used to you know to help with your motivation um, I've um, just had a question in from Sharon uh, if, I'm sure she won't mind me using her name Sharon on this and it's it's almost a challenge back to us how do you muster up that sense of feeling like you can succeed, especially when you're dealing with health issues, managing low income and that level of exhaustion? There is a real tension there, isn't there? Yes, there is. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that I mean, that, you know, the fact that you recognise that you've got lots going on, um, you know, is really important as well, because I think, you know, sometimes we don't sort of, you know, appreciate how much we're dealing with. Um, I like to talk to people about their sort of their stress contain and think about all the things that they're dealing with. You know, this might be the little day to day things or it can be the bigger things such as the low income and the financial worries that, that might go with that or the health issues. Um, I think having really good support networks um, can help us, you know, having the friends and family that we can rely on, good working colleagues, but getting lots of um, sort of you know, feedback from people as well to build up that, um, that sort of, you know, the self-confidence and the self-esteem as well. But this is where sort of you know, praise recognition really sort of ties into it, you know, but getting lots and lots of support, um, whether it's the practical things, you know, you know, for your for, for the health issue um or sort of you know financial support as well um but but it but it is a big one um one of the things i heard recently was that um one in five calls to the samaritans over the past 12 months has been for people in sort of you know, financial difficulties so it's it's incredibly common there's a lot of people sort of you know, struggling um at the moment um, but support, feedback, recognition, I think, are really important as well. And, and, and I am and I think, sorry, just, sorry. No, no, no. I'm just thinking through one of the uh, issues, one of the um, activities we're trying to develop through the uh, Strong Early Years London project is this notion of business buddies, um, looking at where somebody feels as though their personal experience of one of the particular topics we cover. Uh, around anything maybe of value to share that with individual colleagues we can link them together and I'm just thinking we there would be similar benefit I would suggest to look at it from a motivational point of view because yeah. that opportunity to share from Sarah's point of view there that um, that it's not something which is struggling alone and can be shared maybe we should look into that if that's something that people would would feel is of value for us to pursue further then Jonathan and I can can give some thought to how best we we activate something like that yeah yeah that's wonderful thanks michael <clears throat> we also need to be mindful of pressure um when it comes to motivation as well because we need a certain amount of pressure but we need the right amount of pressure and that's going to vary from all of us um because again we're all unique and we're different um mental challenges stretch our abilities and that in itself can be motivating and it can make us feel more capable so what we find is that as the pressure increases our performance goes up so we need a bit of a deadline you know we need sort of you know something to aim for and to work towards because otherwise we just become sort of in a board we procrastinate the task fills the time available you know where sometimes you know when you're busy you can actually feel that you want to roll as long as 
means we're not being pushed into high stress and anxiety. So when we're giving people um, direction and deadlines, it needs to, to feel that it's achievable and manageable for that person. It may be that every now and again, people push themselves and they go the extra mile, but we don't want to be pushing people um, continuously to the point of burnout and exhaustion. You know, and I guess that's why we're seeing so much of it in education, schools, colleges at the moment, early years, alliance nurseries, NHS. People are exhausted. They've been sort of, you know, they've been sort of, you know, on that optimum performance for a long time now. And, you know, we need to pause and recharge um, at the moment. So just sort of, you know, bear in mind kind of, you know, the link towards sort of, you know, pressure and motivation, because what we find is that the more motivated we are about something, the more care and um, caring more about it, you know, wanting to do a good job, either you know, for ourselves, for our colleagues, for the children that we're working for. Um, it can lead to stress as well, you know, because it's really important to us. I think that's a really nice diagram to actually share with with your staff, isn't it? And to ask them to locate themselves mm. on that parabola. Is that the phrase? I'm not quite sure what shape that is, uh, where they would put themselves <laughs> regularly or at times um, yeah. just to get a sense of where they feel that. Yeah, because a lot of this is having the insights and the self-awareness, you know, what, you know, what motivates me, you know, what do I believe in, what, you know, what's valuable for me, you know, what are my skills and my abilities, you know, what's my pressure like at the moment, you know, am I sort of, you know, tipping over, you know, into too much pressure, or am I, you know, just about the right kind of amount, so yeah, I, I think it's a really um, useful one just to have a think about and think, you know, whereabouts are we at the moment, and then what can we do, you know, so if we are a bit you know, bored just running around, which I doubt anyone is, you know, then how can we sort of, you know, push that up a little bit? But, you know, if we are noticing people are, you know, going over the other side of the optimum performance and what support can we put in sooner rather than later? And then what happens is we get what we call the flow. Um, you know, this is when you're um, in the groove, in the flow, things feel easy. You know, we're not forcing ourselves. We're not having to rely on our willpower to remind ourselves to do something. You know, we get up and we do it automatically because we, we want to, you know, there's the clear external incentive, the reason why we want to do it. We've got that inner drive and we feel um, that we've got the ability, you know, even if we're stretching ourselves and learning, you know, new tools, new experiences, we still feel that ultimately we can achieve it. And this is when we're going to be most engaged. You know, this is when our morale is going to be higher. This is when we're going to be in our productive state. You know, we're getting things done. Also, things don't seem to be quite as exhausting then. You know, when you're really struggling to do something, it's amazing how much more tiring things can be at times. So how can we boost motivation then? Sort of, you know, thinking about either ourselves or for, for other people um, around us. So... First thing that you need to do is to figure out which of those factors is missing. So is it the external um, incentive that's missing there, the carrot or the stick? Is it the inner drive? You just don't want to or, you know, you can't really see how it's going to help anyone else around you. Um, or is it the ability? Is it that, yeah, you know, I really want to do this, but um, I, d I just don't think that I can. You know, I just, you know, I'm no good at making cakes. I'm never going to be able to, to watch a YouTube channel and uh, learn how to make a cake. Um, so those are the three things that need to be aligned. Um, and then we can go through, if you go through which one is missing, then it's easy to identify motivation. In terms of boosting motivation, um, increasing our abilities can make us feel more motivated. So practicing things, learning new skills, um, but also seeing our improvement, you know, so recognizing when we're improving in things because that gives us that sense of accomplishment and it becomes a bit of a, um, a virtuous circle. You know, you, you notice that you're getting better at something. You think, oh, you know, I want to try this again and, and it becomes better and better. Um, working towards goals. You know, we like a deadline, we like a goal, it can help us stay motivated, you know, and particularly if we know what's expected of us. Um, completing goals, you know, there's nothing like ticking off stuff on your to-do list that can give you that sense of um, accomplishment and competence as well, and can really boost that inner drive as well, you know, it kind of like gets us going. Bargaining with yourself, you know, so rewarding yourself, you know, for the little tasks, you know, building those rewards, you know, recognising yourself, particularly if it's something that you're doing that may be not immediately or obviously visible to other people as well. But, you know, having those little rewards, whether it's just like, right, I'm going to get this report done and then I'm going to treat myself to a cup of tea and a slice of cake. You see, I told you I like cake. Um, it can just help you stay motivated and having a sense of choice. You know, we we don't like always to be told what to do and how to do it. You know, as humans, we like 
having that sense of choice, that autonomy. So choosing, you know, how we do something to pursue a goal can be really effective. So again, this is where leaders and managers need to be careful that they're not micromanaging people and telling people how to do their jobs. We want to say to people, you know, this is the goal, this is, you know, what we're trying to achieve, but I'd love you to come up with the ways that you want to do it. And I have um, a friend of mine, he um, he hates filing. You know, his thing is that, you know, he knows he needs to sort of keep his files all together because he runs his own business, but he hates filing. So the only way that he can make it a bit more um, enjoyable and have a bit more motivation for it is by naming his files by animal type. You know, so again, it's that little bit of autonomy and that little bit of choice. And the one that I particularly like of his is called his squirrel file. So that's where he might read something uh, or an article and then he'll squirrel it away so he can go and read it back later. But <clears throat> anything where we have a bit of empowerment, a bit of choice and a bit of autonomy can increase our motivation and energy levels. If you're a leader or manager, if you've got people within your setting, a um, couple of tips for motivating um, other people. Clear, achievable goals. Um, give people the autonomy um, of how to do something. You know? And this is where developing the coaching skill comes into it because we don't always want to tell people what to do. We want to give them the resources, the ability, to, the confidence to come up with the ideas and achieve it themselves. Connect what you're doing to something that you care deeply about and share that to inspire others. You know, it's a role modeling behavior, being aware of the shadow that, that you cast as well and explaining people why, you know, because if we can explain the reason why we want to do something, quite often the how takes care of itself. Remember though that motivation is personal. Um, each person is gonna have their own abilities, Fairness, equality, equity doesn't mean giving everyone the same thing. It's about listening. It's about the one to ones. It's about the feedback to understand what motivates and helps and supports others. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, if there's something on your to do list that you just don't want to do, just don't do it. And if at the end of the day, you cannot bring yourself to scratch it off your to do list, Deep down, hidden somewhere, there probably is a bit of motivation, you know, so you need to go back through those factors again and find out, you know, which of those motivation factors are there, which is missing um, if you absolutely can't take it off your to-do list. Is that when you're um, sorry? So, that, I that am going to show you my contact details there. Sorry, Anna, I was just, on that slide there, uh, is, so that like where, is that where willpower then comes in? If your motivation isn't there to do it, that's when you pretty much have to rely on... I've just... That's when you would have to rely on willpower, yes, which is tiring, you know, so yeah. you know, quite often we find, yeah, but I can't, I can't just take it off my to-do list. It's like, well, there's hidden motivation somewhere, you know, sometimes it's about trying to tap into it, you know, just think, you know, OK, you know, I've got this on my to do list. I'm really struggling to get going. Is it that I need a bit of more of a deadline? Is it that I need to have someone who's going to notice and actually recognize this? Am I doing this for the benefit of someone else, even if it's not going to benefit me directly? Um, so kind of like go through the model. Um, and, you know, if you can't um, you know, take it off your to do list, there will be some kind of like motivation somewhere. Um, if not, you may have to re rely on your willpower, which is going to be a bit more um, exhausting, but not impossible. Um, there's my um, contact details. So if anyone does want to have any sort of you know, follow up questions, because I realise this is a, a whistle stop tour of um, morale and motivation. But I'm going to hand back over to you, Michael, for your part of the session. Thank you, Anna. That was fascinating uh, and well picked up again after our slight technical hitch there. Thank you. Uh, it was strong motivation to pick it up uh, from there, if I can just make the link. Um, <laughs> uh, and also just to remind colleagues um, that we will be sharing these slides. Uh, and so part of the information you'll get over the next couple of days is um, further sessions that are coming up through the Business Connect um, processes um, under the Strong Earliers London program. Um, you'll see them listed there. As ever, we are trying to do different times of the day. Um, this is a lunchtime session, but there are some morning ones there, etc. And also Saturdays are being introduced for those who feel appropriate. All of those links are live when you receive, the, um, receive these slides. So you'll be able to click straight through and register your, um, your willingness to take part. Thank you, Anna. And from that, as I said, there is wider support outside of the London, uh, sorry, the Strong Early is London programme. We, 
we are assuming that most participants who engage with us through this project are would be identified as small medium-sized enterprises uh, and we'll give you the definition of what that means on the next slide but if you as you do qualify um, as an SME there is additional support that can be made available through, through the, the London Business Hub uh, and the information will again be on the slide you get and you can link through to the advice from business advisors up to 12 hours of free business support which I think it, it is a sizable amount of support that comes uh, from the GLA through the ERDF uh, program. Um, next slide please Anna. Uh, and finally um, as I said at the beginning if you need any further information you'd like to find out more about the program itself or to register your interest in engaging with some of the one-to-one -one support that we can offer for you directly for your setting or for your pr provision if you're a childminder do please drop a line directly to Jonathan or myself with the details listed there or we now have a dedicated phone line uh, if you'd rather talk to an individual rather than just give some information about um, what areas of support you're interested in and we can help work through um, how we can possibly be of um, best help towards you so it's a new service that we've been able to develop over the last um, month or so so please do take advantage um, as early as you can to to see what we can do for you I think Anna in your control of the slides is that the last one that's uh, that's the last slide yes um and so I'm happy to um take any sort of um questions that we've got for the next that was I was going to say if the really? if there are any other comments questions that people wish to raise now please do so otherwise as Anna has said she's um very kindly made herself available directly um through those contact details if there's any issues you wish to pick up um, but for those of you who have joined us in your lunchtime, um, in your lunch break, thank you for doing so. So I'll just um, a nice quote, quote from Leanne with, and she'll provide the cake, Leanne. Uh, yeah, we'll I know. I'm, I'm going to make a note of her contact details. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Claire would say many thanks. Uh, I share your thanks for that. Thank you very much for the session, Tracy. Okay. It's delightful. If there are no questions, we don't um, artificially extend these to fill the full hour. We're grateful for the time you've chosen to spend with us. Um, do please follow up with any issues that you want through those contact details. It just remains for me to say thank you to all of you for joining us today. My thanks to John for his technical support, especially when things went a bit pear-shaped there with the connection. Kept me sane. Uh, and for Anna for being as brilliant as ever and so well informed and accessible. And it's a delight and I would invite you to spend, enjoy the rest of your day with full motivation. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye.